Welcome to the Optimal Bio Podcast. At Optimal Bio, we don't just balance your hormones, we balance your whole body. Our conversations range from nutrition to medicine with an emphasis on wellness tips to support your health journey. If you like what you hear, find us on the web at optimalbio.com and follow the podcast so you don't miss an episode. Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Optimal Bio's podcast. Was it the third time, fourth time? I've lost count at this point, Jim. Well, we are honored again to have us, have Mavis Jamal, a PA from our Cary, North Carolina office, join us to get, again. And I think today we're going to be talking about detoxification and toxins in our food supply, water supply, how it affects the body. I think a lot of us tend to assume that our food and health and water supplies are perfectly healthy for us. And that's always not necessarily the case. And today Mavis is going to talk about some of the research she's done and hopefully we'll have a lively discussion about it. Let's start with um, what you've been researching, you know, some of the things that you, you know, were trying to look at first, Um, kind of just walk us through your journey and, and getting to where you are right now from a just detox topic. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, I've been studying functional medicine. Um, Some of you that have been listening to this podcast know that. And last year, I attended the conference through IFM on detoxification. And it just like opened my eyes to so many things. And I was just like in awe. But it also is very frustrating and also depressing. Like there's a lot of emotions that you feel when it comes to detox in our environment. But that's kind of, you know, when I really opened my eyes to a lot of this stuff. Um, And then after that, I just kept doing more research. And then, you know, I, you know, I just kept learning as much as I can because it's very, very relevant to hormones. And I've had hormone issues majority of my life. So I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta learn what I can and figure out how to help myself and help my patients. So that's kind of how I got to this point. Um, but I don't really know where you want to start because there's so many things to talk about or potentially to talk about. So, well, you want to talk about water first? Oh, water. I'd love to talk about water. Speaking of water, we're we're hydrating. Well, let's talk about that. So in the old days, you know, fluoride was sold in water supplies as uh, uh, good dental health. And, you know, if you go to the dentist on a regular basis, you know, they'll give you fluoride treatments, especially when you're a kid. And they always talk about fluoride being a wonderful way to strengthen the enamel so you don't have cavities um, as you, you know, consume more toxins, junk food, you know, when you're younger. And uh, so, you know, is that a, is there any truth to the fact that fluoride is a uh, a strengthener um, or, or not? So let's talk about that. Yeah. And, you know, I was just thinking about it the other day. I remember in elementary school after lunch in fifth grade, we would stand up in a line and they would all give us this little shot of fluoride rinse and they're like rinse your teeth in fluoride you know after you eat and I'm just I look back and I'm like like what and it's in most people's water supply which you can actually google this information and figure out if it's in your water supply which most places it is um so you probably are getting it in your water you're getting it in your toothpaste most toothpaste have fluoride in it um So yeah, it's out there. It's out there. But why is it a bad thing or is it a bad thing? Well, I would say it is. So, so most people are familiar with the term endocrine disruptor, right? And so what does that mean? So there's toxins and chemicals in our environment that either mimic certain hormones or act against certain hormones or just, just disturb our endocrine system in some way. And when it comes to fluoride, Oh man, it does lots of things. But one of the most relevant things that, you know, we work with here with our patients is the thyroid. Um, So it can really affect the thyroid because they compete with iodine. 
Um, and so iodine is a vital nutrient for the thyroid. But if we are, you know, having all of these other fluorides and chlorides and all these other things in our system, then that's affecting our thyroid's ability to have iodine and use iodine. But it's also been shown to decrease sperm count. Um, it affects ovarian function. So um, again, iodine's important. And when we are intoxicated, so to speak, with these other compounds, then that gets in the way. So when it competes with iodine, what you talked a little bit about the benefits of iodine, but where, you know, why is iodine so important to the body? Yeah, so the thyroid needs it. And so the thyroid can't make T4 if it doesn't have adequate minerals from iodine. And so that's just one piece of the puzzle, right? But the thyroid is the most important because that's what drives energy and that's what drives metabolism and um, and works with your sex hormones and, and the mitochondria and all that stuff. So, I mean, you can't live without a thyroid. That's why it's important. <laughs> you know, you need your thyroid. To clarify, you can live without a thyroid because there are people that have had them removed. Well, you know what I mean, okay? I just want to clarify for the audience. I know what you mean, but... <laughs> you can if you, there's, yeah, those hormones are replaced. But in a world where there's no hormone replacement, if you don't have a thyroid, you're not living. Okay, so we have fluoride in the water, and then we have chlorine also. Let's talk about chlorine. Um, it's, it's the same family. It's the same compound. So all of those, so the bromides, the chlorides, all of those, the same family, they're all competing with the same receptors. And so it's the same situation. It's the same story. Okay. So there really isn't any... You know, you, you always do this risk benefit analysis. Um, so if you, in this case, going back to fluoride, if the benefit is you have stronger teeth and less cavities. Is that worth the risk? I don't know if I've ever seen data out there anyhow that um, talks about, you know, people being on fluoride, whether it's in the water or fluoride treatments for years, whether or not that actually reduced, you know, cavities in, in certain segments of population. I don't know. Have you ever seen any data? Right. Um, I'll be honest, I haven't really looked into that much, but at the end of the day, it's about risk versus benefit, right? So let's say if theoretically it did, we know it can discolor your teeth too. So it's just like anything, too much of anything is a bad thing. So I would say maybe in small amounts, maybe that is helpful, but you know, I've seen kids with their teeth being stained and things like that. And if you're getting it in your water and in your toothpaste and here and there, then that's you know, obviously too much, right? So, um, but to me, in my opinion is thyroid function or strong teeth. You can also get strong teeth by eating a good diet and not eating sugar and not eating processed foods and diet soda, right? So it's like, I mean, it just seems like a no brainer. Is it true that um, because we're a nation of pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, that they're not totally cleaned out of our water supply? So indirectly, you're people are ingesting some of the residuals of those? Yeah, I mean, they're definitely in there. And that's the real importance of getting a good, clean water filter. Um, so one of the, the the ones I often recommend patients is the Berkey water system. It's really good. Um, I personally, in my house, we use Aquasana and one other company that I can't think of the name off the top of my head. But when you look at these companies, look and see what they test for and see how good it is. And a lot of them will say that they get rid of pharmaceuticals or they get rid of this or you know, they'll tell you specifically. So you want to get a good filter that does filter those things because you want to minimize that impact as much as possible, because that's another way. I mean, birth control is one of the worst endocrine disruptors we can put in our body and not saying that there's a time and a space for it, but. I'm not a fan for it. And it's just, it doesn't, it does, it's an endocrine disruptor. So if we're getting these small little doses of a little bit of this, a little bit of Prozac, a little bit of this in our, in our water, I mean, you can imagine how that would affect us in the long term, you know? Yeah, it's interesting. I look at my mother who's 84 years old and she has maybe two cups of coffee a day. And if she drinks a pint of water um, or half a pint of water, that's it. And you hear a lot today about you must hydrate. You always have to have, everybody's walking around with giant water bottles and so on and so forth. And I'm thinking to myself, maybe she's onto something because she drinks a lot less water. She's not getting a lot of the toxins that other people are getting by ingesting gallons of water every single day. Oh, well, yeah, maybe she's on with something. I just feel like that's an older generation thing. I feel like all of my grandparents, they like barely drink anything. But I think that's also just happens as you get older too. Um, 
And it's a lifestyle thing too, right? I mean, the only reason I drink so much water is because I'm at work and I have this water bottle. But when I'm at home and it's my day off, I probably don't consume half of the same amount of water too, right? Yeah. Um, but I mean, the water was probably much cleaner when they were younger. Well, the point is there are functioning older people and they're still healthy, right? Yep. Which goes back to your environment and genetics. All right. So let's move on to food. Well, what is there in food? So when you look at food, there's lots of things. So heavy metals is probably one of the biggest things that we have to, to look for in food that can be contaminated in either our soil, also our water, but really like their soil and our foods, there can be heavy metals. Um, and depending on where you get your food, there's some companies that actually test for heavy metals, but normally that's not the case. Um, but heavy metals can also be from other sources, not just that, you know, uh, pollution, cigarette smoke, that type of thing. But heavy metals wreak havoc on our microbiome, our gut, or, you know, the, the bacteria in our gut. Um, and they also compete with minerals for like bi at binding sites for the minerals. Um, and I don't know if you've ever heard this, Jim, but mercury actually gets stored in the brain and it can last for like years and decades. So, Lots of things in our food. I mean, there's pesticides, there's herbicides, there's this. Um, but, you know, heavy metals is a, is a big one, too. Um, the pesticides and herbicides, they affect our immune system. They can drive inflammation. Um, they can set us up for, you know, certain autoimmune processes. I mean, there's all kinds of things that we're exposed to um, in our food. Now, the body has a natural way of detoxifying itself. Can you walk us through that? So... It all really starts in the liver. So the liver is a really huge organ that we have in the body that does a lot of things, but it's it's where most of the detoxification and metabolism happens. And this could be for medications that we take, every, the food that we eat, the water that we drink, um, and any chemical that we're exposed to, whether that's through you know the skin or the gut or, or whatever. Um, so, and I've probably talked about this before on other wellness podcasts, but um, there's a couple different phases in the liver where your body breaks down and stuff. And so basically what detoxification is, if you don't know, it's basically your body taking chemicals and turning them into a different type of compound that's more water soluble and easily excreted from the body. And that usually happens through our pores, like through our skin, sweat, also through our lungs, but also our stool, and then some in our kidneys. Um, but a lot of it is coming out in the stool, which is why bowel movements are so important. And I'm always asking patients, how many bowel movements are you taking? And some people are like, you know, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it has, it has to do with everything. Um, so yeah, the majority of those processes happen in the liver. Um, <clears throat> the second process in the liver is highly dependent on nutrients that we eat. So that's why a balanced diet and a good good nutrition is really important. Um, because if you're malnourished, you're going to have a decrease in that phase two detoxification. It's not going to work as well as it normally could. Um, the genetics also affect your ability to break down stuff either in phase one or phase two. So that's why in ge genetics and your environment and the food you eat are very important. And if any of that gets imbalanced, so like, for example, if phase one is highly upregulated, but phase two can't keep up with it, then you develop these intermediate compounds that are highly toxic and that causes damage to your DNA um, and proteins and RNA. OK, so that's that is the the, the downside to not having a balanced metabolism. But once it gets through phase two, it goes into the gut, which is why the gut is so important for detoxification because there's bacteria in your gut that can actually control how you break things down. Bacteria are producing molecules that affect how we break things down. I mean, it's, it's just impressive. Um, and that's why bowel movements are important because if you're not pooping, how many times a day, Jim? How many times a day do you need to poop, Jim? Do you know this? You're going to tell me two to three times a day. Yeah, one to three. Good job. And most people don't do that. But that's how you're getting rid of the bulk of these, these toxins. Okay, so body goes through its natural process. Um, it can only do so much. Eventually, you know, some of these toxins, you know, have a detrimental effect on the body, which you 
briefly describe, but ultimately, you know, they are endocrine disruptors, as you mentioned, which basically at the end of the day, drop our hormone levels, which creates an imbalance in our body and then leads to, you know, people from either not even not feeling well all the way through to, you know, being at risk for, you know, diseases and what have you. So what else can the body do to detox um, in addition to what you just described? So that's why food is so important. So, and that's why I'm a really big fan of plants. Okay. And then, you know, we can talk about diets too. So like, for example, you know, you've got some people on the keto high fat diet or even the corn carnivore, <laughs> carnivore, <laughs> The carnivore diet where you're eating a lot of meats. Okay. So a couple of things about that, and I'm getting off topic, but I just thought about this. Okay. So when you're cooking meats at high temperatures, that's creating actually toxic compounds. That's toxic for our body. So if you're tending to eat a lot of meat or or things like that, and that can happen. Also, if you're eating a high fat diet, most of these toxic compounds are, are, or like attracted to fat, they like fat, so they, they live in fat. Um, and so that can be a concern if you're eating a high fat diet, cause you're gonna probably attract more toxins from the food that you're eating. Um, also a lot of these like, you know, keto, carnivore, and again, I'm not saying one diet is good or bad. I just wanna, I just wanna put that out there. There's, there's always a diet for everybody. I'm just explaining the, the key points. Um, a lot of those diets, they lack fiber and they lack phytonutrients. And when it comes to our body's ability to detox and break things down, we need fiber and we need phytonutrients. So phytonutrients are chemicals that are in plants um, that actually enable us to detox better or they enhance our detoxification process. And then fiber is a binder. So it, it, it binds to stuff and it moves things through, pushes things through. So fiber is, they call it like a phytochelator, right? So it's like, it's binding to things and moving things through. So you need lots of fiber and plant chemicals or plants to have adequate detoxification. With that being said, you need adequate meat too, because a lot of the phase two processes are dependent on animal-based products. So you really need a good mixture of both of those. Um, And then a lot of like gluten-free or vegan diets will have a lot of rice consumption. And rice is probably one of the biggest um, sources of of arsenic. Um, So you were asking what are some things people can do with with arsenic. There's a certain, um, I mean with rice, there's a certain way you can cook it that decreases the amount of arsenic that's in it. Have you ever heard of this? I have heard of that, but I've not heard that you could cook differently to reduce it. So why don't you walk us through that? What you do, and I, I was so excited when I learned this because then I started doing it. I don't make rice that much, but I do every once in a while. So you boil the rice like you would normally. Um, you boil it for like five minutes, like a, a good boil for like five minutes. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, you dump out that water and then you fill it back up with clean water, clean filtered water. Okay, let's just make that clear. Clean filtered water. And then you put it on like medium or medium low and then cook it the rest of the way through. And so that's supposed to decrease the amount of arsenic significantly. So that's just something very simple that we can do to to decrease the contaminants, right? Because it's not like we can completely get rid of them, right? We just need to reduce the load so that our liver is not getting that overload all the time. Um, Yeah, so that's just a couple examples of, you know, why it's good to have a variety of both animal and plant and how there's a purpose in our body for both of them um, and why fiber is so important to kind of move things through the bowel. So I'm going to challenge you a little bit on on the arsenic uh, rice situation. First off, how does arsenic get into rice or get produced by the rice as, as you're cooking? Yeah, so a lot of it's in the soil. A lot of it's soil contaminants. And arsenic is in what? In fertilizer? Yeah, all the, all of those, all of the above. Okay. Now the Asian population um, obviously consumes a lot of rice. Um, you know, China, Japan, other other countries, um, and they seem to have a healthier thyroid than we do in the U.S. Is that true, or is that a myth? I don't know, but that'd be interesting to look into. I thought Dr. Brandon had mentioned that the thyroid cancer rates in Japan were way better than they are over here, most mainly because there's a lot of iodine in the food. So I'm just wondering if the iodine, um, you know, counterbalances the arsenic that's 
you know, prevalent in, in rice. No, but minerals do. So, so um, I don't know if I said this already, but minerals compete with the heavy metals, right? So the more minerals you have, and you know what my favorite mineral is, magnesium. But anyway, so the more minerals that you have in your diet, they're competing for binding. So they also kind of serve as, as, you know, a detox inhibitor, I guess you would say, because instead of the heavy metals binding to to our bodies and our cells and our receptors, the minerals are. So I'm always telling patients, you know, hydrate with minerals, especially if they're doing fasting, um, because that's a really good way to kind of displace the, the heavy metals so that we can just kind of like poop them out and sweat them out and get them through instead of them taking hold. Interesting. All right. So, yeah, obviously I have the pesticides you have that eventually get into the soil um, that lead to other chemicals. And I want to talk, go back a little bit to you know, this high protein, you know, meat diet where you talked about, you know, cooking meat at high heat, you know, creates toxins. Um, give us a little more detail on that. So when you cook meat and any meat, and you know how some people will char it? That char, that is that is the toxins. That's, that's the bad chemicals that, that you do not want to consume. Um, so when you're cooking, it's actually better to cook on low heat, very slow for a long period of time. And it's also better to cook with, with wet and not dry. So the, I love the crock pot for this reason, because I'll throw something in, you know, you, you'll have, you have like your bone broth in there or whatever, and then you just cook it low and slow for eight, 10, 12 hours. It's, that's so much better than putting it on the grill, high heat dry heat, charring it up, producing those compounds that are then toxic to our cells. Because that, again, that's putting more work on our cells and our mitochondria and you know our, our glutathione and all these things, these anti antioxidants. And especially if you aren't eating plants with this and you're not eating antioxidants and you're not eating fiber and, and other plants to help with detoxification, it's just not a, it's not a good combination. So is it the fact that the meat is being cooked at such a high temperature, the fat uh, and or the nutrients in the meat turns turns toxic or is it just the heating element that makes it toxic? It's the heat at that high temperature. Right. So if you're cooking on an iron skillet, for example, then, but what I'm saying is, does the heat convert the meat into toxicity or is it just charcoal, for example, or you know, natural gas, it's coming in through propane that's coming in through the grill. So uh, I guess what I'm asking is, are there ways to heat meat where you get a benefit of the crispiness, I guess, uh, and at the same time, it's not toxic? The crispiness is the bad part. <laughs> the crispiness, what the crispiness turns into from the high heat, that is what becomes toxic. Right. So at the end of the day, the actual meat, meat product is being converted into a toxicity. Yes. I'll have to question that one down the road. I'll do some research on that. Just like how when you throw something in the microwave, whatever the microwave does to it, 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 it can, can change it, right? Just like when you cook something, like, I don't know, a piece of broccoli, the different way you cook it determines the nutrients that you're going to get out of it. So it, it changes the composition of it depending on how you cook it or how you prepare it. Okay. Yeah, because there's that healthy balance out there where, you know, you want to cook your meat. I personally don't like it super cooked. You know, I like it medium rare. But, you know, there's a lot of health departments out there saying you must cook your meat where it's no longer red. It's, you know, a very dull pink, so to speak, um, to get rid of some of the bacteria and what have you. Um, so in that does that same rule apply then to, you know, chicken and fish and any other type of protein you're going to cook? You can still cook it to its internal temperature without charring it. Right. I'm saying, though, but if you char it, does that same rule apply to the other protein sources in addition to meat? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the, you're a plant person, so what are some of the vegetables, plants that we can ingest that will you know, help clear out the toxicities? 
Toxins, rather. Garlic, onion, that family is really good. Also, the brassica family. So um, your broccoli, cabbage, kale, cauliflower. Um, those families are really good. Um, curcumin and turmeric. Those are really good compounds. Um, curcumin's like my favorite. I talk about all the time. Um, those are really good compounds. And then also just think like herbs and spices. If you could just douse your food in herbs and spices of any kind you know you're getting all these different you know plant compounds and phytonutrients from all these different things it's a really good way to get more plants into your diet just by seasoning your food with with herbs and spices so where does kale stand on the list kale is that your favorite no it just it was a super super food a few years ago <laughs> i mean it is for some people um yeah so that's still within i'm pretty sure that's also in the brassica family um as well yeah it is um so yeah that helps with the phases as well but i mean like i said it's not everybody's favorite superfood but again that depends on your genetics so that's why it's really important to understand your genetics and your pathways and how you break down stuff and you know i'm sure one day personalized medicine with genetics is going to be like the way it is and everybody's going to know this and we're going to base everything based off that but we're just not there yet but well and that that's a good point but you know, you're obviously a PA, you've done a lot of research on it, and you might have the wherewithal to figure out your genetics. You know, the average person may not. So what do they do? Like, What are some of the things that, um, in addition to just not cooking your meat, you know, at super high temperatures and eating more vegetables, um, how do you figure out your genetic makeup if you don't have the wherewithal to, you know, go to a geneticist or do a ton of research on your own? Well, anybody has access to like 23andMe or uh, what's the other one? Ancestry.com, I think. Um, I mean, anybody can do that, you know. But yeah, I mean, yeah, if you don't have a provider that could order these labs for you, I mean, sometimes they could be blood, a blood draw. Sometimes they can be like a mouth swab or spit saliva. Um, but yeah, if you don't have access to that, then you could always just get like a 23andMe and then interestingly enough there's actually certain databases that people have created where if you have your raw DNA data you can actually plug that into databases and it can tell you all kinds of things I mean obviously you'd have to have somebody to help you to interpret it and read it if because you're not gonna understand what it means um, but there's ways of, I mean there's ways you can do it yeah well let's talk about that then what does when you talk about 23andMe are you talking about buying the entire suite um, of research or are you talking about just trying to figure out where your ancestors came from and what regions they're from and and going from there i think they have different packages i don't know i did it several years ago so i don't remember but you can get just like you can do the health i think there's like a health package and just like a regular like what's my ancestry um but you would need to get the whole the whole thing to have your whole set of raw data to work with if that's what you were looking to do so maybe it's for the person doesn't have the wherewithal to do, you know, lots of genetic testing and some of this other going to see a specific, you know, healthcare provider that specializes in this, you know, what are some of the things that they could do, you know, that would help them with their toxicity? You could simply just think about it as starting to increase more color in your diet. So let's just think about phytonutrients, like the rainbow colors of the rainbow. So you've got red, orange, green, yellow, purple, you know, all the, all the colors of the rainbow. So just by simply adding more color to your diet, you know you're getting more phytonutrients from the plants. So that's just something really simple you can do just by simply adding more color of the rainbow to your diet. Um, and sweating. Sweating is so important and it's free because if you get outside or you do a nice workout or whatever the case may be you can sweat and like it's super important to sweat and a lot of us don't sweat enough we don't sweat enough we don't poop enough um but just simply by sweating every day that's going to help you get rid of toxins right so um i would say some some just very simple tips would be adding more color to your diet um and getting plenty of protein that's another thing think about plants Plants and protein, P and P. Okay, so when it comes to detox, you want plants and protein. So getting enough protein, protein with every meal, getting more color, and just sweating every day. I mean, those are things that most I feel like most people can attain. When you're talking about colors, you're not talking about just sticking with the greens 100% of the time, adding carrots, adding squash, adding other peppers or what have you that have different colors. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
eat, literally just eat each color. We talked a, little, a lot about vegetables. What about fruits? Any specific fruits, blueberries, strawberries? I mean, are they more in, able to help you know with this or are there other ones that are better? Yeah, there are some that are better. So your berries packed with really good antioxidants. Um, pomegranates are also very interesting because they they help specifically with detox. So that's just like a fun little thing, you know, pomegranates, they're fun. Um, think about your, your carotenoids. So like your, um, your carrots and um, orange, like orange and red fruits and vegetables. Um, so yeah, those are, those are very helpful. I think more of an issue with females than males, but there's a lot of toxins in makeup in other in hair products, for example. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's males too. I mean, if you if you look at male products, it's just as bad, especially thinking about like shampoo, conditioner, body wash, all these things. Um, yeah, so they're not tightly regulated, right? Because a lot of these chemicals that are in our personal care products, they're not tested. They're not tested for health concerns and, you know, most of them aren't. And um, a lot of them aren't safe, right? So if you just look at the ingredients on any of your self-care products, you're going to not know 95% of them because a lot of them are, are chemical based. Um, I really, really like um, going to EWG.org, Environmental Working Group, because they've put together a whole database where you can look up products, whether that's cleaning products personal care products, whatever, for male and female, and you can look at what you're using and you can look at the toxicity on that. So it actually has the data, the toxicity, and it gives you better alternatives, which I find really helpful. And you can just start by simply just picking one product that you use and just switching that out. And every month or two, just like switching it out. You don't have to like go and revamp your whole house and you know throw everything out and start over. But that's something you can just little by little start switching your your products into something that's that's better for you that's less toxic and does on the website did they recommend other products to replace the products that you're using yeah you can look up better products because they have ratings they have like a rating scale um and i think one or two is the best but yeah so you could just you pick based on the rating and and yeah that's awesome it takes you to the website and you can buy it excellent that's great great advice so when you're seeing patients around this, you know, what are some of the things that you do for them? Yeah. So one of the initial questionnaires that we have in the wellness program is a, an environmental toxin questionnaire. So that kind of looks at the history of like, okay, what were your past exposures? What are your current exposures? And so I kind of look at that and kind of start with, okay, what are the most pressing issues or the, the biggest priorities that we should focus on? Um, whether that's the amount of plastics that you use and in, in whether you eat out of or cook with or whatever, um, or, you know, what about lead or do you live, you know, I don't know, all kinds of things in this questionnaire. Um, so that's kind of what we look at to see like, okay, what are the priorities? Where should we start? Um, and then, so basically you could, you know, if, there's lots of ways to approach detox. You could do it with supplements. You could do it with food. But I'm always like a food first type of person. So what you know what you can do if you want to do a food detox, we'll we'll walk the patient through um, how to support phase one, how to support phase two, how to support phase three. Um, and this is not something you're going to do long term. This is a short term like detox protocol um, with food. And then, you know, for some patients, depending on their health history, depending on their labs, depending on their goals, we might add additional supplements. I'm just throwing some out here, for example, maybe like curcumin or milk thistle or knack or, you know, there's just some other supplements you can take that might either support um, glutathione production or decrease inflammation or support detox. So there's other supplements and stuff that you can add. But just keep in mind, anytime you're doing a detox of any kind, um, it's not something you want to do long term. It's something you want to do short term um, because you want to give your body rest. Because basically you're up regulating the liver's job. And so the liver needs rest after a little bit. And that's kind of where taking that to the next level that some, a lot of providers these days are recommending intermittent fasting as well, which gives the body a chance to reset also. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, intermittent fasting is, 
is one of the greatest things you can do for detox. And not just that, but it also decreases inflammation in your gut. And, you know, if you think about it, your gut is sending lots of things to the liver, right? I mean, straight from the gut, the, you're, it's going straight to the liver. And so if you have leaky gut or inflammation, that's just increasing the burden on the liver because you've got like undigested proteins and these immune complexes that, you know, let's say you have food sensitivities or whatever the case may be, or even bacteria that's going straight to the liver. So fasting helps to give the gut some rest, you know, like to your point, and it also helps give the liver rest and it just kind of helps give the whole body rest so that it can regenerate um, and be healthier. What are some of the symptoms of toxicity that w would be acute and then some of the minor ones? So acute are things like like you would know, like you're going to be acutely ill, acutely sick. I mean, that's like a whole other situation. What we're talking about here, Jim, is when someone slowly, slowly these things are accumulating over time and building up in our tissues and building up in our fat and our brain and our organs. And then it causes something called, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction to where your cell cannot cannot function the way that it used to. Right. And then. If those things are happening, that's what leads to disease. That's what leads to inflammation. And most actual diseases are caused by inflammation. Um, and so so it's not like it's going to be just one symptom, right? It's like these things over time then cause these system imbalances, which then lead to diabetes and heart disease and, you know, all these things. So it's like over time, these things are just slowly adding up, adding up until boom, then you have the diagnosis, which is a really cool thing about our wellness program because we're trying to look at things before that happens, right? We're trying to look at, okay, what are the factors that we can get ahead of? Like for insulin resistance, for example, like if we see evidence of that, like we're trying to, to get ahead of that. Um, before diabetes develops, right? And a lot of that has to do with toxins because um, the organophosphates, for example, like think about agriculture, chem agricultural chemicals, um, industrial pollutant, combustion, that type of thing. Those type of chemicals are highly, highly, highly correlated with insulin resistance and diabetes. And so we know this. And so like if you have a patient with insulin resistance or diabetes, like you're going, to want to, you're going to think about a detox from that perspective, right? Because they have inflammation. They probably have some mitochondrial dysfunction. So it's kind of just like looking at the system imbalance, but there's not like one sign or symptom that you might notice. I mean, there's some that are characteristic here and there, but um, it's usually more of like a gradual process that creates the disease. It's almost like it's silent in a way. You just simply don't know because nobody's going to go get labs done every, you know, 10 minutes and it's, um, you know, and again, I think there's, as I said earlier, an assumption out there that our, our food supply is safe and our drinking water is safe and probably is safe from the sense of, you know, not getting bacterial infections and, you know, other, you know, food and um, waterborne diseases that, you know, people suffer from in the past. But on the flip side, um, you know, it's, it's to your point earlier, it's led to a lot of other you know, illnesses, you know, that seem to promulgate society right now. We haven't talked about sleep yet. What does sleep do? Oh, sleep is, again, it's, it goes back to that rest, right? It's all about letting the body just rest, detox, and in charge. And that's actually where a lot of detox happens is when you're sleeping. But one of the biggest detoxes that happens while you're sleeping is with the glymphatic system. And so that's kind of like what drains, you know, your brain and all that stuff. Um, and, you know, if that's not happening, you're waking up with foggy head, you know, maybe even headaches, um, not feeling refreshed because your body is not able to detox properly if you're not getting adequate sleep or not getting actually deep sleep. And so, you know, that's another reason why hormone balance is so important, because if you're not sleeping or able to go to sleep or get a deep sleep or, you know, all of that, then you're not detoxifying. So, yeah, it's all it's all connected. So let's talk about the future. I mean, do you have any insight uh, on future directions in in this field of detoxification? Um, you know, kind of like what I was saying earlier. I think personalized medicine in general, you know, based on individuals' genetics, I think is probably the future of it. 
Um, but with that being said, you know, they say that 90% of chronic disease is actually determined by your exposome and not your genome. So I don't know if you're familiar with those terms, but <clears throat> so your genome is like your raw gene data. Your exposome is kind of like your your environmental exposure and how that interacts with your DNA. So even though DNA is important and everybody is all about personalized medicine and what's my genes, 90% of what happens is actually from your environment, which is something that is not always in our control, but I think it's more in our control than we perceive it to be. Um, so although I do think that's part of the future, I, I think education is just going to be very necessary moving forward. I think just, you know, educating people and getting them to know that they actually have more control and power over their environment and situation than they think they do. Um, I just, I hope that's part of the future of this because we can make a difference. Good stuff. Anything else you want to tell the audience? Yes. So it's about the gut. So I just, again, want to talk about how important the microbiome is for detoxification. Um, and I think earlier I had talked about how um, the gut bacteria kind of play a role in how you metabolize um, and break down things. So I just want to give an example. So one of the most common things that is well studied is an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase. And that's actually produced by bacteria in our stomach. So, and just, just to wrap your head around that, bacteria in our stomach produce produce things that affect our metabolism. Like that's how important the bacteria in our stomach are. But um, so yeah, beta glucuronidase, it's, it's like there to help us, but if it's in too high of a quantity, it can kind of hurt us. So what it can do is it can kind of cleave these toxins that our body is trying to bind and get rid of and it kind of like cuts them to where they become reactivated and recirculated back into our system so if we have really high amounts of this enzyme working overdrive then um, that can actually cause increased levels of estrogen in our body so which is really important for what we do here because a lot of what we see here, we do see a lot of estrogen dominance, even in the younger populations or in the perimenopausal population, we do see a lot of estrogen dominance. So if you have high beta glucuronidase, that's working against you. If you're not pooping every day, that's working against you. One of the best things to lower beta glucuronidase is fiber. So I just wanted to highlight fiber again and how important it is and yeah, I mean, it's just, it's super important for detoxification and hormone balance. And you can't really, you know, this goes hand in hand, hormone balance, and detoxification, they go hand in hand. So top 10 or top five foods that are your best source of fiber. Oh, plants, plants, <laughs> most plants have fiber. So you got, you have, you have soluble and insoluble fiber, but literally if you're talking about fruits, vegetables, that's where you think fiber. Meat is not a good source of fiber. Like it's just, it's just not. Um, the grains, it depends on how it's made and what type of grain it is, but safe bet all the time, fruit or vegetable has fiber. That's a safe bet. As always, thank you for joining us again. This is a very interesting topic and um, hopefully uh, our audience took something away from this and We'll think more and more about what they're putting into their bodies. So thank you. This has been a production of Optimal Bio. Optimal Bio is CEO Tyler Brannon, podcast host and partner Jim Baker, medical director Greg Brannon, production assistance by Core Media, Beth Grabencourt, administrator, Kevin Duthu, executive producer, the podcast can be found on our website, optimalbio.com, on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Our theme song is Sunwave by Paradiso, provided by Epidemic Sound. <laughs>